Estate planning is not always just about what happens after you pass away. The most important part of estate planning is what happens to you during your lifetime. If you were to become incapacitated right now, what plan do you have in place to take care of you? Now, all of this together, all the documents that we're gonna talk about today, all of this goes into your estate plan. Revocable trust, a revocable trust, it's the fundamental foundation of your estate plan because it says what needs to happen during your incapacitation and what happens after you pass away. If we put a revocable trust up against a last will and testament, there are several advantages to the revocable trust. A trust maintains your confidentiality. When you have a revocable trust, the information in that trust is confidential. It's your information. The only people that are really entitled to see it are your trustees, your successor trustees, and really your beneficiaries. And even your beneficiaries, there is some argument that they really are only entitled to see the sections of the trust that actually pertain to them. A trust, a revocable trust, maintains your confidentiality. As opposed to a probate, where if you have a last will and testament or you don't have a last will and testament, and you have to go through the probate process, everything that's in that probate down at the courthouse is usually always public record. So anybody who wants to can just go down to the courthouse or even attend hearings and hear and see exactly what's going on in your probate. A revocable trust also gives directions on what happens if you become mentally or physically incapacitated. And it'll work in conjunction with your power of attorney if that's needed, hopefully not, and your healthcare power of attorney. The revocable trust allows and gives directions for what you want to happen if you were to become incapacitated. And because you've funded everything correctly and everything's in the name of your trust, your successor trustee can simply step in and take over the assets, I should say, for your benefit, right? Because they have a fiduciary to take care of you. If you had a last will and testament or nothing at all, then your loved ones would have to go down to the courthouse and most likely get a guardianship basically a living probate over you while you're living to take care of you. And that is why it is so important that you recognize that estate planning takes care of you during your lifetime. With proper funding, proper trust funding, your revocable trust will work hopefully exactly like you intended it to do. But if you leave assets out of your trust, then your trustee does not have control over them. And that's why it's so important to have your trust as the foundation of your trust, because if you have also done a power of attorney, then that power of attorney, if you're still living, can go out and change the title of that asset that is not in your trust and put it into the trust for distribution and for, for them to be able to have control over it under the terms of the trust. Now that's in great opposition to if you have no estate planning whatsoever, your family would again have to go get a guardianship to take care of those assets that are not in the trust or just take care of those assets in general because there is no direction by you on what you want to happen with those assets. And those could be bank accounts, financial accounts, it could be commercial real estate that you own, little rental houses that you own, maybe a side business, whatever it is. It's really important because a revocable trust will give direction to your successor trustee on how to take care of those assets and what to do with them so that you are taken care of exactly how you want to be taken care of. Oklahoma Revocable Living Trust is the same as a revocable trust almost anywhere else. For 99% of the United States, an Oklahoma Revocable Trust is going to be very similar to a revocable trust in any other state. And what's nice about it is in most jurisdictions, an Oklahoma Revocable Trust will be recognized if, for example, the person who created it has moved to another state. I will say that if you have moved to another state and you are going to probably make that state your lifetime residence, then after a few years, it might be a good idea to visit with an estate planning attorney in that jurisdiction and see if the revocable trust is going to do exactly what you want in that jurisdiction. In general, a revocable living trust 
made in one state is going to be good in another state. You have options. And like I say always, you need to be reevaluating your estate plan on an annual basis. If you've moved to another state or you've moved to another jurisdiction, then you might revisit whether or not that revocable trust needs to be restated for specific laws that are in whatever jurisdiction you're in. Just make sure you keep your trust up to date and you should be okay. Pour over last will and testament. Basically means that if you have a revocable trust centered estate plan, your pour over will or your pour over last will and testament is there just in case you forget to put an asset into your trust. So let me give you an example that we see on a regular basis. A couple will come into our office and we will do a revocable living trust for them. And we do all of it. They get a, a revocable living trust centered estate plan. And as part of that process, we make certain that the house that they're living in is put into the name of the trust. In other words, we change the title from Jim and Sally Smith to Jim and Sally Smith trustees of the Jim and Sally revocable living trust. Got it? What we see though, is that a lot of times as they get older, they will sell that house and maybe downsize to a smaller house. And when they do that, they forget to tell the title company that they have a trust or somebody doesn't catch it for whatever reason. That new property, that new real estate, that smaller house gets put into just their name. And when they pass away, because it's not in the trust, it has to go through the probate process, which defeats the whole purpose of why they got a revocable trust in the first place, right? It's really important to have that pour over will just in case that does happen. And the pour over will, the pour over last will and testament basically states that if there are any assets that are not in the trust, we are going to have to probate them, but we are going to put them into the trust so that it will be distributed according to the terms of that trust. See what I'm saying? If you don't have that pour over will, then it's going to probably be probated under whatever jurisdiction you're in, whatever state you're in, under the laws of intestate succession. So the property may not go to who exactly that you wanted it to go to because you did not leave any direction. A pour over last will and testament is an essential part of a revocable living trust centered estate plan because it's kind of a catch all, it's a bucket that'll catch assets that are not in the trust, put them into the trust for distribution according to the terms of the trust, exactly how you wanted it to happen. Durable power of attorney. A durable power of attorney grants somebody the power to be your agent to legally act on your behalf, even if you are to become incapacitated. And that's really important because there are some power of attorneys out there that do not go beyond incapacitation. Basically, a durable power of attorney is a power of attorney that grants somebody the authority to act legally on your behalf. As part of a revocable living trust centered estate plan, this is an essential document. I talked about a pour over last will and testament and how it's kind of a catch all. The problem with having that or having to use it is that you have to go through the probate process. And so if you are to become incapacitated during your lifetime, let's say that you name Sally as your power of attorney. And Sally is also your successor trustee. So as successor trustee, Sally is going to look and see what all of your assets are. And Sally sees that you have a little rental house that is in your name only and not in the name of the trust. Because you are still alive, Sally can exercise her power as your power of attorney and transfer that rental house, transfer the title from your personal name to the name of the trust. Why is that so important? It's so important because by giving Sally that power and Sally actually using that power to transfer that, that rental property from your name to the name of the trust, she has literally saved your estate thousands of dollars by putting it into your trust now. Because once you pass away, if Sally did not exercise that power or she did not have that power, then that particular rental house is going to have to go through the probate process, costing your estate thousands of dollars. So that is why a power of attorney is so important. A durable power of attorney will allow somebody, your agent, to act on your behalf 
and make sure that all of your finances, make sure all of your assets are truly funded into your trust for distribution according to the terms of the trust, exactly how you want things to happen. Healthcare power of attorney. A healthcare power of attorney is very similar to a durable power of attorney or, or power of attorney, but it only deals with your health. And this is a very important distinction. But a healthcare power of attorney grants somebody, your agent, somebody who you implicitly trust, to make decisions on your behalf, health decisions. This person could, depending on the jurisdiction, have the authority to prevent people from seeing you physically, determine which doctors you should be going to, what medicine you need to be taking, all of that. And these are all important decisions that a healthcare power of attorney needs to have the power to make. A healthcare power of attorney is going to work in conjunction with your successor trustee as part of your revocable living trust centered estate plan to make sure that you get the health care that you need. And what I mean by that is your health care power of attorney needs to work with these other folks to make sure that money from the trust is getting spent on your health care. This really creates a good checks and balances for you, for your health care to make sure you're taken care of because you have one person that's actually in charge of your health, making sure you're getting the exact care that you need, but you also have your financial person, whether that's your successor trustee or your, or your power of attorney, who's looking after the money to make sure that your healthcare power of attorney is spending that money correctly. That doesn't mean that they should deny you from getting care, the care that you need, but you also don't want your healthcare power of attorney going off on maybe some crazy tangents that you didn't want or spending money on procedures that really are not going to have any effect on your health care. And that goes down an, an, another route of actual fraud. But what we're talking about here is creating checks and balances of having your successor trustee and your health care power of attorney and maybe even your uh, durable power of attorney all working together to make sure you are getting the health care that you need, getting the services that you need to keep you in your house as long as possible if that's what you want, to do everything that you have outlined through in writing and through conversations with them to get you the health care that you want. Living Wheel Advanced Directive or Advanced Directive Living Wheel. <laughs> they, the, both those terms can be used interchangeably depending on what jurisdiction you're in. But a living will is a very important document that is part of your revocable living trust centered estate plan because this is the document that lets the world know not only medical professionals, but your family and your health care power of attorney. It lets everybody know exactly how you want to be cared for if you are in a persistent vegetative state. Those are the key words, unfortunately persistent vegetative state. Now, what does that mean? That usually means, again, depending on your jurisdiction, that two independent physicians have determined that there is zero brain activity and there is zero possibility of that brain activity reigniting. If that's the case, what do you want to happen? Do you want to get continue to get food, water, and pain medication? Do you wanna be on a machine? to help you breathe, all of these decisions are up to you and they are part of your living will or your advanced directive. Some people want to continue to get food and water, but they don't want any pain medication. Some people want just pain medication. Again, these are decisions that you have to have to make. Check with your own medical professional before you decide on this extremely important issue. The living will advanced directive is an extremely par important part of your revocable living trust centered estate plan because like I said, it outlines, it gives instructions to the world on exactly what you want to happen. The unintended benefit of this is that it also alleviates the pressure. It takes the burden off of the shoulders of your family or the healthcare power of attorney that you have named because you have told them exactly what you want to happen. So instead of them having to have sleepless nights and talk to people, pray about it, and trying to decide what to do for you because you are in a persistent vegetative state, instead of having to worry about what you would think, 
You have done that for them. You have said exactly what you want, whether that's just pain medication, whether it's food, water, and pain medication, whatever the combination is, you have made that decision, not them, not anybody else. All the healthcare power of attorney, all the medical personnel, all the family has to do is follow your wishes, which you have specifically put down in writing to take care of you. HIPAA authorization. <laughs> you guys have probably heard of this every single time you go to the doctor, the hospital, or go anywhere to get any kind of test. Almost all medical personnel want you to put it in writing on who has access to these medical records, whatever the procedure is. Who can they talk to? Who can they show records to? It's very important to have a HIPAA authorization, a general HIPAA authorization in place as part of your revocable living trust centered estate plan. So your three key documents in your revocable living trust centered estate plan are your healthcare power of attorney, your living will slash advanced directive, and your HIPAA authorization. HIPAA authorization is usually a general grant of power to all medical personnel to share your medical records, your medical information with specific people. We can make that more specific. And we see this usually when people are very sick and maybe they're in their last days of their life or they're just older and they have very specific medical professionals that they see on a regular basis. Like they always go to this doctor, they always go to this hospital, they always see this specialist. If that's the case, we will usually always put those specific entities or those specific people in there and stating that you want them to specifically share your medical information with these other people, with people who you just feel need to have this information to make decisions on your behalf. Usually your healthcare power of attorney is the main person that is to receive that information. All of this is part of your revocable living trust centered estate plan to get you the health care that you want exactly how you want it. Trust funding lawyer. Usually your estate planning lawyer is also a trust funding lawyer. It's really just a term to help you, assist you in funding your trust. Now I've already talked about in other videos how important it is to fund your trust. What a trust funding lawyer will do is they will sit down with you and list out every single asset that you own and what the value of it is, how it is titled, where it's located. Now, usually your estate planning lawyer is gonna do this anyway. That's why I say they're usually the same person. They're gonna make a list or have you make a list for to help you. But if you decide to use a trust funding lawyer to actually get all of your assets into your trust, then it's a pretty specific process of listing out all of your assets, where they're located, you know, what institutions, if they're real estate, where are they located, and preparing all of the documents that you need to transfer all of those assets into the name of the trust. It's pretty easy for a trust funding lawyer to get your real estate, maybe even your cars, stuff that has titles on it, into the name of your trust. Financial institutions are usually a different story. Trust funding lawyer can assist you with getting the correct forms from those financial institutions, but they usually want the client to specifically fill out the forms or to actually sign them and get them to the financial institution. And I get it, it's a privacy issue. They wanna make sure that they're dealing with the correct person, but a trust funding lawyer is usually an estate planning attorney as well, or estate planning lawyer, and they will help you get all of your assets into your trust. This also is actually an extra service for most estate planning lawyers. Ask them how much it's gonna cost for them to assist you with funding your trust. Your estate planning lawyer will usually insist on your residence and whatever real estate that you own, that it, they will insist that that gets put into your revocable living trust, into your revocable trust. If you need them to assist you further, that is usually an extra charge. We actually have our clients try to do a lot of the financial accounts by themselves first, and if they run into trouble, then we will step in. But I always tell people, you know, don't, don't initially spend money on us if it's something that you can do on yourself. The whole goal of this is to get your revocable living trust centered estate plan done exactly how you want it done. Real estate in trust. This is so vitally important if you have a revocable trust. Getting your real estate in trust. 
If you're going to spend the money and the time, if you're gonna spend all of that time and effort to get a revocable trust, then it is essential, <laughs> guys, this is essential that you get your real estate into trust. It has to be into that revocable living trust or else if it's not, like I've talked about in previous videos in this playlist, then if it's just in your name when you pass away, then that piece of real estate is going to have to be probated. And it's not only if you were to become, if you, if you pass away, if you become incapacitated and it's a rental house, there might be some issues on who they're supposed to pay their rent to, your tenants, right? So you want to make sure that all of these assets, all of your real estate is in the name of your trust. It's really important that if you do have a revocable trust, that you get your real estate into trust. Talk to your financial advisor, talk to your estate planning attorney, and make certain that all of these assets, all of your real estate is in trust so that your revocable living trust centered estate plan works exactly how you want it to work. I know I've thrown a lot at you today, so that's why we've prepared our free guide on estate planning. I'll put a link to it in the description below and in the comment section below that so that you can download it and get started in the right direction. And to help you out even more, watch this video up here and this video up here. If you enjoyed this video, then guys, please smash that subscribe button and click on the like button. And also click on that little bell so you'll get notified every time we post a new video. Have a great day and an awesome week. And as always, thanks for watching.